Hello, I'm continuing my reviews on the Friday the 13th series with Friday the 13th Part 6, Jason Lives. Now, this came out in 1986, and this, of course, is the sixth film in the Friday the 13th franchise. Now, I already reviewed this, along with all the other Friday the 13th movies, all the way back in 2011 for Season 1 of Horror Month. Those reviews are still up, however, they're no longer public. They're now marked as unlisted but you can still see them on the Horror Month Season 1 playlist, which I'll leave a link to in the description below. And I recently did new reviews on the first five Friday the 13th movies, which you can see on the playlist for Horror Month Season 13. Now, what Friday the 13th Part 6 was written and directed by Tom McLaughlin, who prior to this directed a movie called One Dark Night, and he would go on to direct one of my favorite Stephen King adaptations, sometimes they come back. Now, what Friday the 13th Part 6 concludes what fans consider to be the Tommy Jarvis trilogy, which started with Friday the 13th The Final Chapter. Now, the final chapter ended with Tommy Jarvis killing Jason, so Friday the 13th Part 5 A New Beginning was an attempt to take the series in a different direction where Jason was not the killer in that one. Instead, it was a copycat killer, and throughout that movie, Tommy was starting starting to lose his grip on reality, and at the very end of the film, you saw Tommy put it on the hockey mask, and that movie was meant to establish Tommy as the new antagonist of the series, but fans were not happy with the direction that that movie tried to take, and they demanded more Jason. Now, because of how Part 5 ended, a lot of people assume that this one is just pushing 5 out of continuity, but I would argue that you can still count 5 is canon because they do reference the fact that Tommy was in a psychiatric hospital and I kind of look at the ending of 5 as either being a dream sequence or perhaps Pam was able to get through to Tommy before he was able to follow through with killing her. Admittedly, you do have to kind of come up with some headcanon stuff in order to really connect the two movies, but if you split hairs, you can still count them as being in the same continuity. But at the same time, Tommy is so radically different in this one than he was in the previous film that he is almost a different character in this movie. So yeah, because fans were so disappointed that Jason wasn't the killer in Part 5, they brought Jason back for this movie. This is the film that officially takes the series in the realm of the supernatural. The first five movies had elements of the supernatural, like it was somewhat left up to the viewer's interpretation whether Jason really did die as a child and came back, or if he was just living out in the woods the whole time as sort of a feral boy. I feel like there were there was at least room for both interpretations with the first five movies. And the first five films arguably tried to have an element of realism, but in this one they drop all pretenses at realism and they officially establish Jason as a supernatural being. Now, I'm gonna say it, Friday the 13th Part 6, Jason Lives, I think is the best film in the franchise. When I was younger, there were other ones that I think I liked a little bit better, but as I've gotten older, I think this one is definitely my favorite. And this is also the only Friday the 13th movie that critics seem to like. Even though the original film has gotten somewhat of a critical reevaluation in recent years, for the most part, these movies were pretty much bashed by the critics, and I think this is the only one that really got any sort of positive reviews. Although I think Siskel and Ebert still hated it. But even to this day, I hear from a lot of people who aren't even big Friday the 13th fans say that this one is actually their favorite, and part of the reason I think that is is because this is more of a horror comedy and almost works as a parody of the first five movies and is kind of a satire on slasher films in general, but it's done in such a way where it doesn't feel condescending to the genre, unlike a lot of horror satires. 
And Part 6, I think, is a very clever movie. I think it's probably the most smartly written and most well-made of the franchise. It's a funny movie, too. I think it's a really funny movie. But it also works as a really solid Friday the 13th movie, and as a really good horror film in general. Now, I believe Tom McLaughlin has said that he wanted this movie to almost feel like an updated version of Universal Monsters, and I absolutely love that approach for a Friday the 13th movie. And the movie that probably had the biggest influence on this movie was James Whale's Frankenstein, which of course is based on the Mary Shelley novel of the same name. There's a lot of Frankenstein references and parallels in this movie, which I think is really cool. So, the plot of Jason Lives is it follows Tommy Jarvis, who is still suffering from severe PTSD because of what happened to him as a child, and he is still being plagued by nightmares and hallucinations about Jason. So, him and a friend of his escape from the psychiatric hospital, presumably the halfway house from the previous film, but that's never actually confirmed. And Tommy believes that if he destroys Jason's body, it would stop the hallucinations, so him and his friend drive out to the cemetery where Jason is buried, and they dig him up. After opening up Jason's casket, Tommy has a complete psychotic breakdown, and in a fit of rage, he grabs a metal fence post and shoves it right into Jason's chest. And as luck would have it, this ends up getting struck by lightning, and Jason comes back from the dead as a zombie. So, the newly resurrected Jason kills Tommy's friend, and Tommy tries to warn the sheriff about this, but the sheriff, of course, doesn't believe him, and when Jason commits a series of murders in the town, Tommy, of course, becomes the prime suspect. And the sheriff's daughter might be Tommy's only ally. Meanwhile, Jason returns to the newly reopened camp, which is now running with kids who are now potential targets for the undead psychopath. Now, the film stars Tom Matthews, who people might recognize from Return of the Living Dead, as Tommy Jarvis. And I think for a lot of people, despite the fact that two other actors have played this character before him, I think for a lot of people, Tom Matthews is almost the definitive Tommy Jarvis. And Matthews is great in the role. He's very sympathetic, but he's also quite funny as well. Tommy definitely has a sense of humor in this movie. Now, Tom Matthews plays this character so differently than John Shepard did that you would be forgiven for thinking that this one is ignoring the events of Part 5, but I would argue that if 5 is still canon, that makes his arc in this movie all the more triumphant. Because in Part 5, he was this close to going over the edge, but in this movie, he realized that he was able to walk back from the edge of the abyss, and he was ultimately able to maybe not completely overcome his trauma, but at least overcome the worst aspects of his trauma. And ironically, Jason coming back might have been the shock that Tommy needed to cure him of his insanity. I actually met Tom Matthews back in 2014, and I got him to sign my copy of the movie. Then you have Jennifer Cook as Megan, who is the film's secondary protagonist, and is essentially our final girl. And Megan is a great character. She's a freaking badass, and she's hilarious as well. The only thing about her character is, looking at her from sort of an adult perspective, she has no idea who Tommy Jarvis is, and yet she helps this guy throughout the whole movie, and yeah, Tommy does turn out to be right, but at the same time, she doesn't know that. <laughs> But you get the idea that she's mainly helping Tommy, one, because she does have the hots for him, but this also all seems to be in defiance of her father. And in a way, kind of the point of her character is she essentially is just a dumb teenager, but this is a case where being a dumb teenager actually turns out to be the right thing, which is a very subversive element of the film, I think. The movie also features David Kagan as Sheriff Mike Garris, who is Megan's father and is essentially the film's secondary antagonist, even though if you actually watch the movie, everything Sheriff Garris does in this movie is right. 
How he approaches the situation is exactly how any rational person in his position would approach the situation. Let's say you're the sheriff of a small town and you have some guy who you know suffered a very traumatic experience as a child and you know has spent some time in a mental institution come bursting into your office claiming that a long dead serial killer has come back as a zombie. Of course you're not going to believe him! And when murders start happening, of course you're going to think it's this kid committing these murders. Yes, Sheriff Garris is a hard-ass, and he's a major dick to Tommy in the beginning, and you could argue that, knowing what Tommy went through, he should have shown Tommy a little more compassion, but at the same time, how much compassion are you going to show somebody who tries to take a gun out of the gun case in your office, and how much compassion are you going to show somebody who you think is committing murders in your town? But that is a very clever element of the story, making this guy who, for all intents and purposes, is doing everything right. The villain. And you know what? I think Sheriff Garrus is a great character. He's shown to be a loving father, even though he is a little strict. And you can tell at the end, with his interactions with the children at the camp, that he's shown to have a very kind and compassionate heart, and seems to genuinely care about protecting people. He's just going after the wrong person in the movie. You also have Vincent Guasafero, I'm probably butchering his last name, as the sheriff's deputy, and he is such a dickhead in this movie. It's interesting that in any other slasher film, this guy would be dead meat, but he actually lives in the movie, although his ego definitely takes a hit. And of all the Friday the 13th movies, even though this one's a comedy, this, oddly enough, I think has some of the most believable characters in the entire franchise, especially Megan's friends, the camp counselors. They come off as genuinely good kids who definitely don't deserve to have Jason going after them. You have Carrie Noonan as Paula, Reese Jones as Sissy, and Tom Friendly, who I think is actually related to John Travolta as Court. And speaking of John Travolta, you have Ron Palillo, who acted with John Travolta on Welcome Back Carter, as Tommy's friend who escapes with him from the mental institution at the beginning of the film. This movie also features a very early appearance from Tony Goldwyn, who would go on to play the villain in Ghost. The movie also features a small role from Nancy McLaughlin, who was married to Tom McLaughlin, I think until 2019, and I believe she's been in just about all of his movies. The movie also features C.J. Graham as Jason, who I think is a pretty underrated Jason. And the movie has some great humor in it, and a lot of really funny sight gags. Like, there's a scene where this misogynistic paintball player is chopping at a tree with a machete because he just lost to a woman, and he's like, Dumb broad! She tricked me! Just stay in the kitchen where she belongs! And then Jason grabs his arm, rips his arm off, and throws him against a tree. And, and then you see that a smiley face was carved into the tree where his face hit. And you have a lot of fourth wall breaking jokes in the movie, like you have the groundskeeper at the cemetery where Jason was buried, throwing dirt back onto Jason's casket, not realizing that Jason is alive and is out of the casket, and like as he's throwing dirt back in, he's like, why do they have to go dig up Jason? And then he looks right at the camera and says... Some folks have a strange idea of entertainment, basically chastising us, the audience, for watching the movie. And then you have that same character when Tommy confronts him later on about digging up the grave. He just says, dig him up. Does he think I'm a fart head? And then it cuts to a bunch of kids at the camp screaming, Yeah! And then later on you have that same character drunk off his ass in the woods, and he kisses the liquor bottle saying, Darling, you're gonna be the death of me. He throws it and Jason catches the bottle, breaks it, and then kills him with the fucking bottle. Like, you have a lot of jokes in the movie like that. The film also has a lot of meta humor, like Elizabeth, Nancy McLaughlin's character, stop in the car, seeing Jason in the middle of the road saying, I've seen enough horror movies 
to know any weirdo wearing a mask is never friendly. The film's opening title sequence is literally a parody of the title sequence for 007. You also have a road in the movie called Cuttingham Road, which is an obvious reference to Sean S. Cuttingham, who directed the first movie. There's also references to a nearby town called Carpenter, which is obviously a reference to John Carpenter. Then you have all the Frankenstein references in the movie, the fact that Jason comes back to life by lightning, and then there's a reference to a store called Karloff's General Store, which is obviously a reference to Boris Karloff, who played the Frankenstein monster in the universal version of Frankenstein. In fact, the opening scene of the movie where Tommy and his friend are digging up Jason's grave was apparently a direct reference to the opening scene of Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. The movie also has a kick-ass soundtrack. Harry Manfredini's score for the movie is really well done, and you have all the Alice Cooper songs on the soundtrack, like Teenage Frankenstein, and of course the song Man Behind the Mask, which Alice Cooper actually wrote for the movie. And it's interesting that this is the only Friday the 13th movie with no nudity. There is a sex scene in the movie, but the sex scene is not even remotely graphic. And there is violence in the film, but oddly enough, the violence doesn't feel as exploitive as it does in the other Friday the 13th films. And because of that, this feels like the most accessible film to either non-fans or newcomers to the franchise. But yeah, I love Friday the 13th Part 6. Like I said, I think it's the best film in the franchise, and I highly recommend it, as long as you understand going in that this movie does not even remotely take itself seriously, and it's kind of poking fun at the rest of the series, but not doing it in a mean-spirited way. And the movie honestly has a lot of heart. Now, there was a novelization of this movie released around the same time. I never read the novelization, but I would really like to. Apparently, the novelization does explain the gap between this and Part 5 a little bit more, and apparently Jason's father, Elias Voris, shows up in the novelization. We find out that he was actually the one paying for Jason's grave. Now, like I said earlier in this video, this was the first film in the franchise to introduce overt supernatural elements into the Friday the 13th universe. I mean, the earlier films had subtle elements of the supernatural, but this is the first movie to go outright supernatural, where Jason is literally a zombie, and Jason would remain a zombie pretty much for the rest of the franchise, not counting the reboot. And after this, the series would go kind of batshit insane with the supernatural elements, where in the movie right after this, Friday the 13th Part 7, Jason actually fights a girl with telekinesis. And then there are literal demons in Part 9, and it's implied in that one that after Jason first died as a child, it was actually demonic forces that brought Jason back. Now, unfortunately, this was the last film in the franchise to feature Tommy Jarvis, not counting some of the flashbacks to this movie that you saw at the beginning of Part 7. Now, I heard that when they were making Freddy vs. Jason, there were talks of having Tommy Jarvis appear in that one, and he actually is referenced in an earlier draft of the script for Freddy vs. Jason. Tommy did show up in the Freddy vs. Jason vs. Ash comics, but that depends on whether or not you actually count those comics as canon. Tommy is a playable character in that Friday the 13th video game from a few years ago, and they actually did get Tom Matthews to come back to voice him in the game. Now, a few years ago, there was a series of Friday the 13th fan films called Never Hike Alone, which I think act as direct sequels to this movie, but ignore the continuity of the other Friday the 13th sequels that came after this one. But they actually got Tom Matthews to come back to reprise his role as Tommy Jarvis in those fan films, and I believe Vincent Gustafaro, again, I'm not sure if I'm saying his last name right, also comes back in those fan films as well. Now, because this is a slasher film that's very meta and kind of makes fun of the tropes of the slasher genre, I believe this was actually an influence on Wes Craven and Kevin Williamson's Scream, which came out ten years later. 
Now, before I end this video, I just want to cut to a clip of my late friend Chris Mano, who is a huge Friday the 13th fan, giving his thoughts on this movie. This was taken from a retrospective that we did on the Friday the 13th franchise, all the way back in 2018. Now, I distinctly remember sometime back in 2019, me and Chris actually watched this one together, which makes introducing this clip kind of bittersweet. This is my personal favorite one, and it's there's like so many great things that work about it. Like, obviously, Tommy's kind of come out of the whole mental stupor and everything, and he's he's really trying to like bring himself back up. But there's also the awkward fact that he's the reason Jason is back in this one. Um, and there's a lot of really cool um, sort of undercurrents to it. Like, it is self-aware at certain points. Like, the scene where the dude from Welcome Back, Cotter is like, he looks like right into the camera and he goes, people got a strange idea of entertainment. That's like a really great self-aware moment. And um, also, it's got this weird um, kind of feminist undercurrent, uh, especially with like the character of Meg, who's really well written and, you know, you really are uh, rooting for her, like by the time you get to know her. And I think this is when he when he kills the people who are paintballing. There's a scene where like she jumps down and she's like, "This needs a woman's touch," and she takes them both out. <laughs> like, yeah, it's it's. I think this is like probably one of the few openly feminist uh, Friday the Thirteenth movies. So that's significant. And on top of that, it's just really fun, honestly, to watch. Really cool kills. Um, the self awareness adds a a great another level to it and for that it's it's definitely my personal favorite and now here's my friend jeremy giving his thoughts on part six friday the 13th part six jason lives is a very good entry in the series it features the return of jason and his, his return is spectacular the opening scene is great it's dark there's fog everywhere and there's a storm brewing. Tommy Jarvis and his friend Alan Hawes go to Jason's grave in order to cremate him and once and for all put Tommy's mind at ease. Unfortunately, a bolt of lightning strikes Jason's body and he comes back to life. The opening kill is perfectly gory with Alan Hawes' heart being punched out and I just love the way Jason looks at the camera after he puts on his infamous hockey mask. In this movie, Jason is played by C.J. Graham, who does a good job. I've met C.J. Graham twice, and he was very nice both times. This is the first movie in which Jason becomes an indestructible zombie. Personally, I preferred it when he was more human, but I still enjoy this version of Jason. Tommy Jarvis is back, this time played by Tom Matthews, and I gotta say... Tommy should have left well enough alone. If it hadn't been for him messing around with Jason's grave, Jason wouldn't have come back in the first place. I met Tom Matthews, and he was very nice. Tommy is definitely a lot more talkative in this movie, whereas in the last movie, he was quieter and more withdrawn. Another character of note is Sheriff Garris, played by David Kagan. He's a total asshole who doesn't believe Tommy when he says that Jason has come back, and for most of the movie, thinks that Tommy is the one killing people. He definitely means well, and you know that he's just trying to do what's best for everyone, but even so, he comes off like a complete prick. I also want to mention that this is the first film appearance of Tony Goldwyn, who would later go on to become a very well-known actor. He doesn't have much of a role, but it's still cool to see him in this early film appearance. I must say, I really liked the idea of Jason being brought back to life by a bolt of lightning. It's similar to how the Frankenstein monster came to life. Another scene I like is when Jason is in the cabin and the girl is praying for her life. That also gave off a kind of Frankenstein vibe, in my opinion. This entry in the series was directed by Tom McLaughlin, and I must say, he did a great job. I met him back in 2021, and he was great to meet. He told me all about how they filmed the opening death scene. Anyway, I'll wrap up here. Definitely give this one a watch. Now here's my friend John Riccadelli giving his thoughts on Jason Lives. Here are my thoughts on Friday the 13th, Jason Lives. The opening scene where Tommy and his friend are going to the cemetery to double check to make sure Jason is dead. Seeing lightning strike Jason and bring him back to life felt like Frankenstein's monster. And the cemetery scene reminded me of the opening scene of Frankenstein meets the Wolfman when two grave robbers rob Lawrence Talbot's grave. The director Tom McLaughlin said on the Blu-ray interview that's what he was going for. Pay and tribute to classic Universal monsters. Again, just like a new beginning, boring cliche characters. I cannot care less about these characters. It's stale, flat. It doesn't do anything different. 
Just the same old stuff Jace has done the last five movies. These new characters stink. Once again, the NPA just don't learn to stay out of the series business and let them add the gore kill scenes. The actor who plays Tommy in this movie is also forgetful. This is the last time we saw Tommy in the series. Part 4 through Jason Lives is the Tommy Jarvis trilogy of the Friday the 13th series. The sheriff care is an idiot. He doesn't believe Tommy that Jason is bad no matter what he says. How is this guy promoted sheriff? He couldn't be staff sergeant for how much he sucks at his job. The romance with the sheriff's daughter and Tommy was so dumb it was forced. I really don't care if these two end up together or not. There's no chemistry. This is the first time and only time in the Friday the 13th movie series where the Camp Crystal Lake has kids at a campsite. We never saw this in previous movies. Anytime the camp was about to be reopened, Jason killed the council before the camp was starting. There's a part in this movie that always stood out to me as a little kid watching this movie. Seeing Jason walk inside the room where the kids are sleeping, he doesn't kill the kids. Some fans pointed out that maybe because kids are innocent, and that maybe that's why Jason does not kill the little kids, but I could be reading too deep into that. The part when you have these rednecks playing paintballs were pointless. They could have cut these characters out, it wouldn't have any effect on the movie. I guess I just needed to add more kills for Jason. CJ Graham does an okay job in this movie as Jason. I met CJ Graham back in 2013 at Chiller Theater. He was very nice. He told me he's friends with Kane Hodder, the next Jason actor. The one good part to this movie is they got two Alice Cooper songs added to the soundtrack to this movie. Teenage Frankenstein and The Man Behind the Mask. Despite it's cool to hear Alice Cooper songs in this movie, sadly does not save the movie. Coming from someone who loves Alice Cooper's music, one of my first heavy metal singers I first got into at the time when I was a teenager. Just like in the beginning, they also tried too hard to make this into a dark comedy. It's badly written. This movie's bad, dumb, stupid, lame, and it's just not one of my favorites of the series. And again, I rarely watch this movie. I apologize, John is 100% wrong about this movie. And finally, here is Joey giving his thoughts on Friday 6. Friday the 13th Part 6 is another cool movie in the franchise. In my opinion, it's another one of my favorites. As I have to say, when it comes to the Friday the 13th franchise, they did a good job with the sequels. Part 6 is uh, another one of my favorites out of the series, out of the franchise, because it's, really, it's, it's a cool movie. It has Tom Matthews as Tommy Jarvis. It's not Corey, Corey Feldman again, but it's Tom Matthews, which, which which is an awesome character, and the guy who plays Court is actually John Travolta's nephew. I'm, I, I actually text him at times on Facebook. Um, he's really a nice guy. This is actually where I believe they got the Nintendo game idea from, because it has where you got it, like where the kids were in the cabins and stuff in the movie, and that's the way the Nintendo in the 80s game was. And then it has like a messages in the game, well, that was like in Friday the 13th, like Jason goes to the hell, but this is, I believe, is where they got the Nintendo game from the 80s, and in my opinion, was really, I thought it was a cool game. And this movie is more funny than scary. A lot of these horror movies are to me, even the Leprechaun was, but in this case, a lot of the movies, the horror movies are, are more funny than scary, like horror comedies, they're cool. The music was cool too. And Friday the 13th Part 8, actually I thought that music was cool too in that movie, it reminded me of the Friday the 13th series, that kind of music. And actually I watched the Friday the 13th series at, at times, it's not nothing to do one with the movies, but... Um, I have to say, though, in my opinion, that was really cool, too, that series. It was back from the 80s. I thought it was awesome. Um, but yeah, the music in Friday the 13th, part 6, I thought was cool. And, um, but yeah, I, I strongly recommend this movie. Um, this is another cool one in the franchise. Um, I strongly recommend to see this, too. So, yeah, I hope you enjoyed that. That was my review of Friday the 13th, part 6, Jason Lives. And my next movie review will be on Friday the 13th, part 7, The New Blood.